Thank you, Peter. Our keynote speaker for the day is Dr. Matthew Shepherd. Um, Matthew is a soil is a specialist in soil biodiversity um, at Natural England. I'm going to say a little bit about you because you're very special. Matthew's work includes advising on soils policy, conservation of soil organisms, and encouraging better management of soil biology to improve sustainable environmental management and monitoring of soils and soil life. His PhD was on the effects of grazing on Dartmoor soils and he has worked in upland erosion surveys as well as providing evidence reviews of England's peatlands. He also runs the National Mite Recording Scheme. So I'm sure you'd like to join the band. He says he was always looking for excuses to talk about bugs. So um, we're delighted to, 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 to thank you very much for coming at this. Well, at short notice, because Matthew gave a short talk at our, our other event at Wood Farm, a joint event with um, Devon Wildlife Trust on the 1st of June. And I was so impressed that I, I rang him and said, would you come talk for us at Langford? <laughs> I know it's very short notice. And he very kindly agreed. So thank you. Thank you. Hi. I just assumed I'd be given an hour because my talk overran at Langerford, so clearly it wasn't enough time. Thank you very much, Donna. Yes, my name's Matthew Shepherd, and I'm here to give you a beginner's guide to life in the soil. Now, um, I'm afraid it's quite bright in here, and so it's not that easy to see the soil. I'll try and describe things that you can't see because they're too hazy on the screen, but um, I hope if you have, want to have a, a copy of this presentation or see any of the pictures, then do just get in touch with me and I'll be able to send that on to you. So yes, I'm Matthew Shepherd, Soil Biodiversity Specialist for Natural England. And um, as an outline for the talk, I thought, first of all, I'd introduce soils not as a material or as a resource, but as a habitat, a place where animals live and grow and, and go through their lives. And I thought I'd give you a quick tour of different soil organisms as well, just to give you a flavour of the sort of organisms that you find in soil. Then I'm going to talk a bit about what soil organisms do for us, the functions, how they interact with soil function, how they make soil work, but also what we do to them, how our management of the soil affects soil organisms. I'm going to touch briefly on what the range of soil organisms that you'll find in soils can tell you about the soil and how it's functioning and what the conditions are like. So what they can tell us. And then finally, I'm going to touch a little bit on conservation of soil biodiversity, which is an area that a lot of conservationists, to some extent, just brush to one side and assume is rather too complicated to look at. So um, it's, uh, we're right at the beginning, I suppose, of, of conservation of soil biodiversity. So I thought you, you're in on the, on the very sort of first floor of that, of that process, so welcome. So whoops, I'm just going to start my um, talk here, which is a very long way away from here. This is up in Aberdeenshire. This is the uh, village of Rhiney. And the reason I'm starting my talk here is because I thought I'd start at the beginning, and this is part of the very beginning of soils. Back in 1912, a local physician who was a keen amateur geologist called William Mackey was wandering along, saw a dry stone wall, and he saw a rather unusual um, stone in the wall. It looked a lot like this. It had little circles in it. It was a little hard, flinty church stone. And he thought it was very interesting, so he took it to uh, the local university, and. Um, the uh, geologists there were able to inform him that this stone actually was full of fossil plants. There were plant stems. And not only were there plant stems, there was also some other things fossilised in there. And so they went back and tried to find out where it, what, where it came from and discovered that actually this deposit was from 390 million years ago. Now that's a really interesting time in geology because 390 million years ago, there was really only life in the sea. Life on land hasn't yet happened. But at this point, we were just beginning to see plants emerging onto land. What William Mackey had found was a fossilised community of some of the very first plants to make it onto land, some of the very first life on land. And what was fascinating about this is not only had it fossilised the plant stems, it had also fossilised the soil that the plants were growing in. We've got fossils of some of the very first soil on the planet. And fascinatingly, it didn't just fossilise the soil, it fossilised the creatures that were within that soil. And here are some diagrams that they actually drew from that fossil soil. This one here is a creature that's got two antennae, a little tube sticking out of its tummy and six legs. This one here has got eight legs and a pair of pincers for mouth parts. And these are genuine fossils from the Rhiney Church that, that William Mackey had found. And I think what's really interesting is these were present right at the very first life on land. There was plenty of life in the sea, big armoured fishes and trilobites and so on. But these creatures 
are some that I've taken just a, you know, a couple of years ago, photographs of creature with antennae, a little tube sticking out of its tummy and six legs. This creature here has got eight legs and pincers for mouth parts, so you can't see them too well. But they are pretty much exactly the same, unchanged for 390 million years. And this tells us, I think, that soils have got along perfectly well without us <laughs> for the 389 million years that they've existed on the planet before we showed up. So generally speaking, soils function very well without us. We often imagine we have to interfere with soils, and we'll talk a little bit about what our impacts are on that later. It's worth talking a little bit about what soil is, and many soil scientists will um, show you this diagram and stop there. This is the mineral components of soil, sand, silt and clay. These are the brickwork, it's the building blocks, they're the scaffolding of soil, but it's certainly not all of soil, and sometimes that's where soil scientists stop. They say soil texture, a mixture of these three elements. In many ways it's kind of the least interesting part of soil, because there's also organic matter. That's missing completely from there, and if you rearrange that diagram, you can end up with an organic matter triangle up here, loads of organic matter here, silt and sand bunched together and clay in the corner, so all the mineral soils are down there. Or, you can add in other components, such as air and water, and in fact, actually, in a well-structured soil, two-thirds of the soil can be air and water. And that's really interesting, because this is where things can happen, it's space. This bit here, scaffolding, the brickwork. This is where the space where things can actually happen. We also, of course, have our organic matter, but even more important are the soil organisms, taking up only a very tiny proportion of the soil's volume, but actually driving most of the processes. So I want you to think instead of thinking of soil as being sand, silt and clay, I want you to think of it as being a little cave system because it's not just a question of you know, mixing those ingredients together, it's structured as well. So all of the well-structured soil will have pores that can be connected together. It's rather like a, a fractal cave system. Big caves or smaller caves come off them, which have smaller caves coming off them. And some of those caves contain water, the little ones almost all contain water, the big ones have got air spaces in, and a poorly um, structured soil, for instance, might have very less, much less cave space. So this is a, an x-ray tomograph of the soil. This is effectively a photograph of the space within the soil. So if you can imagine this, the rest of the mineral particles and the organic matter have been removed, then this is how much space there is in a well-structured soil compared to a poorly structured soil. So if you would like to come with me on a journey into these, this soil cave, you imagine yourself <laughs> shrinking down to a, a millimetre or so tall. We're going to go and explore the, um, the cave system, which is the soil, and um, meet some of its inhabitants. And the first inhabitant that we're going to meet is this one. It's probably the most important soil organism. It is a plant. Now, most people get distracted by the above-ground frilly um, parts of plants, but actually this is incredibly important in the soil because plants are the, pretty much the sole supply of food for the soil. Photosynthesis, the plants do, provides carbon, glues carbon together, and the rest of the organisms on Earth spend most of their time trying to break that carbon up and getting energy back from it. So plants pretty much run the show. This is uh, one of the most common plants in the country. This is, of course, perennial ryegrass. I'm sure you recognised it. Most of you have probably got it all over your park. Um, but what's really interesting about plants as well is they don't just produce food by dropping leaf litter onto the ground. It's very obvious to, to see that. But the roots that grow through the soil also die and turn over. And also, the roots will leak out uh, sort of compounds into the soil. They produce a sort of soup. Scientists call it root exudates. And it happens especially at the growing tip. So there's the growing tip of the root. And that will be leaking out a soup of amino acids and sugars and proteins and so on into the soil. Now, it's doing that not because it's wasteful or because it's just leaky. It's doing that because it's actually trying to attract soil life. And the first kind of soil life that it attracts are bacteria. There's a huge flush of bacteria come to guzzle this soup that the plant is leaking out into the soil. And bacteria that come along are excellent chemical engineers. What they do is they can transform almost any organic compound into almost any other one, pretty much. They're excellent at decomposing, but they particularly like sort of easy to decompose, what we call labile substrates. So things that are quite, you know, things like sugars that are, are not too complicated. They like that kind of quick sugar rush, I suppose. And um, they can then convert that into all sorts of different compounds. These ones here are actinobacteria. Um, they grow in long strands. They're also quite big, so there's one of the ones that are quite easy to photograph. You can just about make out a strand there. Uh, these actinobacteria produce a really wide range of compounds. They, they produce, for instance, anti-cancer drugs. Um, uh, there's also another, um, uh, some of the anti-helminthic drugs, the macrocyclic lactones are all produced by these actinobacteria, and they even produce a compound that gives soil its smell, called geosmin. That's produced by actinobacteria as well. In higher pH soils, you get a lot of these proteobacteria taking over as well. They just look like little jelly beans for the most part. And um, there's also, only recently discovered about 25, 30 years ago, 
a dark matter in the soil, acidobacteria. And we only discovered them recently because they don't grow on agar plates. So it was only through genetic testing that we discovered that there is this huge amount of um, acidobacteria living in, especially in acidic soils. They're also present in um, less acidic soils, but then these proteobacteria take over as well. So these bacteria are coming along and guzzling all of the soup at the plant roots, but there are other organisms as well that are trying to do the same sort of job, breaking down organic compounds, and that's of course the fungi. Now fungi have a very different strategy though, because while the bacteria like easily degraded stuff, the fungi quite like tough substrates. So they like eating wood, and they like eating you know, lignin and breaking down cellulose and so on. So many people again get distracted by the above ground parts of fungi, but in fact as a soil scientist you have to be thinking of fungi as being a kind of network of fungal hyphae. So we've got, I don't know if you can see this kind of vague white cloud here, not very good, but these, these are fungal hyphae stretching out through the soil. And um, they stretch out exploring much smaller um, soil pores than plant roots can get into. They're approximately a 50th of the diameter of a plant root, any fungal hyphae. So what they can do, however, is they can team up with plants as well. And one of the ways they do this is by forming what's called a mycorrhiza. Now this green streak you can just about see across the screen here is a plant root. And growing inside the plant root, stained bright green with fluorescent dye, are fungal hyphae. Now those fungal hyphae are actually pushing aside the cell. They drill little holes through the cell wall, wall and push aside the cell membrane and create a structure that looks like a little tree inside. And little trees, in Latin, would be an arbuscule. So they're called arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And the reason they're doing this is because they are getting some of the carbon, some of the, um, I suppose, the soup, directly from the plant, from the cell walls themselves. So the, cell is uh, the plant is producing carbon and feeding it to the fungus. But well, what's the fungus doing? Well, that's actually stretching out into the soil with these tiny little fungal hyphae, which are tiny thread-like structures, exploring a huge volume of soil and beginning to access mineral nutrients that the plant could otherwise not get to. It's particularly important for phosphorus. It will also take 85% of the phosphorus in a plant can come through its mycorrhizae. But maybe about a fifth of the um, nitrogen nutrition in a plant also comes through this arrangement. Also, water flows along the edge of the fungal hyphae as well. It goes to that plant. So the plant is um, really taking in nutrients from, uh, from a much wider range of, of soil pores than it would be able to access otherwise. Problem is, is actually, this fungus has become so reliant on the plant that it can no longer degrade organic matter. So while the other fungus I showed you is actually a, something that breaks down um, soil organic matter and breaks down wood, this one has become a real specialist and it's absolutely reliant on the plant. So if the plant dies, the fungal hyphae will also eventually, you know, after a few weeks, will wither away and die as well. And that's why they produce these gigantic spores, these round circles you can just about make out, are the fungal spores, and they are huge compared to normal fungal spores. And that's because they're able to last in the soil, toughing it out until a good plant comes along for them to colonise, and then they will germinate and recolonise. So this arrangement, incidentally, was also present in those Rhiney Church soils as well. So this is an arrangement that has been effectively enabled life on land to happen. That arrangement between fungi and plants, very important. Now we're getting to slightly larger organisms. These are um, protozoa and nematodes and tardigrades, which are, um, oh, I might have left this one out, I think. Okay, so what we have here are um, uh, organisms which get ranged from uh, the just about visible to the still, uh, still a bit invisible. So our biggest nematodes, such as this um, predatory nematode, will be a couple of millimetres long. And nematodes that are predatory, you can tell they're predatory because they have a huge mouth, often with a big teeth, big tooth, or sometimes three teeth inside them. And they'll actually feed on other nematodes. Nematodes often get a bad press because um, uh, we think of them as being plant parasites, but in fact, only about 12 to 15 percent in a typical grassland will be plant parasites. And the remaining 88 to 85 percent will actually be predators, or bacteriovores, or fungivores, or omnivore nematodes. We also have protozoa which swim around in the soil. Both of these organisms are soil water dwellers, the nematodes and the protozoa. And the biggest ones are ciliates, which have got little rows of cilia all around their body. Sometimes they have what looks like a sort of tail that they can use for swimming. And different bits of the cell are specialised for different functions. Because they even have a sort of mouth. This here is actually the, the organism's mouth. And the reason they need to have a specialised part of their body as a mouth is because if they, they effectively engulf their food by wrapping it up in a piece of cell membrane and then snipping the cell membrane off inside their body. So you can call it a body when it's a single cell. So if they were to do that here, then they'd be snipping off their, um, their own sort of motile, their, their, all the cilia would get folded in. So they have a specialised bit of sort of sacrificial cell membrane as a mouth to eat their food with. 
These ones here are also single-celled organisms, but they live inside shells. These are testate amoebae. And they'll actually live inside the shell and forage. They'll send out a pseudopodia out into the soil to, to look for resources. And if they find something they don't like, they can pull themselves back into their shell. And you can actually use these shells and the range of different um, organisms that you get for understanding how damp a soil has been. And in peatlands, you can see different communities as you go down the peatland, which will tell you how, how wet that peatland has been, depending on which species you've got. Furthermore, it's probably also worth mentioning tardigrades. I think we might actually have some more slides on tardigrades later. But um, tardigrades here are also soil water dwellers. They're also fairly terrible swimmers as well. Crawl through the soil on eight legs, each one with four claws at the end. And they have sort of piercing mouth parts that they can stick into fungal hyphae, but I've also seen one tackling a nematode as well. And they'll actually slurp up the juices from inside. Incredibly tough animals, and um, scientists enjoy torturing um, tardigrades because what they can do is when they dry out, they often live in quite um, tough soils, they can dry out completely, they spit out their mouth parts, fold themselves into what's called a little tun, and then when they're in that state, you can do almost anything to them. Scientists have boiled them and they come back to life, they've dipped them in liquid nitrogen and they come back to life. They've even um, taken one out to the International Space Station, which is quite a uh, good trip for a tardigrade to make, and I don't quite know how they did this, but they opened the window and held it outside and exposed it, <laughs> exposed it to solar radiation, and that stuff will shred your DNA. And they brought it back in again, and not only did it survive the experience, they dropped a bit of water on it, it sprang back to life again, and it had babies. So... <laughs> <laughs> so I think if anything is going to outlast us, when we finally made a real mess of the planet, it'll be the tardigrades. <laughs> um, right, so... Yes, this is a picture of a tardigrade tun here. This, this one here is all folded up. So you can see it's got the... Um, head all, all tucked in there. Now slightly bigger organisms again, we have the uh, columbula. Now these are visible, so we're just in what's called the mesofauna. Mesofauna are defined as things that can fit through a two centimetre hole, but are just about visible to the naked eye. And later we'll be collecting some mesofauna, those of you that are joining me for the workshop. And um, uh, depending on how good your eyesight is, you'll be, you'll, <laughs> you'll be able to, to, to see at least some of them, but some of them are right at the very edge of visibility. Some of them literally look like walking dots, walking specks of dust. So our um, Columbia fall into to four main groups. We've got the Entomobryomorphs, which are these ones here. These are the insect-like springtails, which are kind of long and thin, and they look a lot like insects, but they're not actually closely related. Um, they're actually somewhere between insects and crustaceans. We also have some very strange-looking creatures that look um, rather like this one. looks a bit like a bunny rabbit. It's got a little, little round tail, and these um, aren't ears. Those are antennae. But these are called globular springtails, and they're terrific jumpers. They also dance as well. They link antennae together and dance around, including the ones that live under the soil as well. So there's actually probably dancing happening under your feet, wherever you go. Um, also, we have these creatures here, which are called podgyromorphas. And as you can see, they are podgy. So identical to just podgers. These tend to live deeper in the soil, and fewer of them have got springers. And the very smallest ones are these ones here, tiny little ginger hunchbacks. And those are the knee-lid springtails. So we've got quite a range of those, I hope to see some of them later. But these are my favourites, these are the mites, and as I say, I'm a um, mite recording man as well. But we've got a range of these, we've got the um, uh, white ones, which are not very well slerotized. These tend to be more like weed species. They'll blow in, they'll breed quickly, and then they'll, they'll die quickly. So that includes the house dust mite, of course. <coughs> these ones here have the opposite um, approach. These are in it for the long run. These are orobatida mites. They're long-lived, they can live to five years, and they decompose tough organic matter. And as a result, they quite often have very large bottoms. You can get, judge what a mite eats by how big its bottom is. But if you're eating, if you're eating wood, then you actually have to have quite a large bottom to <laughs> let go of what you don't want. Um, these here are these are stigmata mites, and these are predators. They're like little robots constantly marching around. They're completely blind, so they run around grabbing. They have two um, feelers out the front, which are their front legs. And if they detect something they like, often a springtail, they'll just grab it and dismember it. But they, even then, they don't stop moving. They often you can see them running around with a springtail in their jaws. And we also have perhaps the more familiar velvet mites, which are in the prostigmata. But this group here contains a huge number of different mites, of doing almost every different job you can imagine. It also includes the prostigmata, the mites that live on human foreheads as well. So that's uh, <laughs> anybody's feeling itchy, that might explain. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the reasons I like mites is they are superlative animals. Um, for their size, they contain the strongest animal in the world. So this is the strongest animal here. This is Archigazetes longicetosis. And um, 
what will often happen with these mice, if they get stuck on their back, they will keep walking um, uh, just on whatever substance they have. So if you put one on their back and you put a little lump of soil on top of it, they will just rotate the soil like a sort of rotating ball, like a party piece or a circle strip. Mm -hmm. And I think this one here was observed doing that with a piece of um, soil that was so many times its, its, its own weight that it would be the equivalent of you or I juggling with seven double-decker buses. <laughs> so, incredibly strong creatures, but you can see why, because they're incredibly well-armoured, and these creatures really, because they're long-lived, they have to look after themselves, they look after their resources, and they invest, when they're adults, in extremely tough armour. So that one there, very common, might we'll probably see it today, that it looks like a walking motorcycle helmet. <laughs> but also, they're the fastest animals in the world as well. I mean, soil organisms include the mites, including these anistid mites, which also run around up on the, up on the plants as well. And you often see these charging around on hot surfaces in the summertime. And a relative of them, which is um, uh, this one here, which is Paratosotomus longipalpis. And this one has been uh, clocked at running the length of a standard ruler, 30 centimetres in a second. <laughs> like that. Um, so that would again be the equivalent of you or I scaling up, running about 2,100 kilometres an hour. <laughs> so they're incredibly fast. I think they seem to find hot surfaces to run on deliberately. <laughs> There's also a wide range of other soil mesofauna as well, um, including some insects like um, bark flies and thrips there. But also some creatures you've probably never come across before. Proturas are primitive insect-like creatures that don't have antennae and have a kind of strange cone-shaped head, often get called cone heads. Diplura are two-pronged bristle tails. If you ever pick up a plant pot, you might see one disappearing into a soil pore. Symphyla are like mini millipedes or mini centipedes that are actually decomposers or sometimes feed on plant roots. And we also have these really strange creatures called poropods, which are again relatives of the, um, the millipedes that are perhaps more familiar. So a wide range of different organisms, but the majority of the mesoforms that you'll see in soils are going to be springtails and mites. So those are the ones that I tend to concentrate on. However, you do get some top predators as well. It would be really nice if we could find a pseudoscorpion um, later. These are creatures that have got, so they look just like scorpions but without a tail. So um, they tuck their bottom into a crevice and they grab their prey using these great big claws. These claws are actually, do contain poison as well, so they don't need to have a stinging tail. So these are kind of ambush predators. We also have the geophilid centipedes, um, who are equipped with a pair of poison claws at the front. They've adapted the first pair of their legs, and those contain a really, a really potent toxin, which actually would cause a, you know, a nasty lesion on us if they could get through our skin, but there aren't any centipedes in this country that can do that. We also have beetles. You can't really see that beetle larva very well there, but they are voracious predators in some cases, and both the adults and the young wolves will attack things such as slugs, springtails, mites, and so on. We also have flatworms. There's a handful of native flatworms, but quite a lot of invasive ones as well. And these absorb their prey. So uh, it's all very well being an orobatid mite with lots of armour, but if one of these comes along, it would simply roll over the top of them, exude digestive juices over the poor creatures and slurp them up. <laughs> um, lots of soil organisms get around by jumping, like the springtails, but um, many of the predators will actually hitch a lift. That is a pseudoscorpion pitching a lift on a gnat, so that gives you an idea of the scale of things as well. That is probably about this big, so the pseudoscorpion is a couple of millimetres long there. But lots of organisms do this, there's lots of soil organisms, many mites actually will, there's a, a group called the um, astigmatina, the dust mites, which go through a stage where they don't have a head, and they will then glue themselves onto the back of another mite, which is quite a slow moving mite, you think, well why have they done that? But then that mite will glue itself onto the back of a beetle. And then the whole lot will go travelling off, so it's called a hyperphoresis. Really interesting <laughs> phenomenon. Getting bigger again, we now have earthworms and anchitraids. Earthworms are very consoling creatures because they come colour-coded. You'll be pleased to know. You can tell what an earthworm does simply by looking at the colours that it has. So we have epigeic earthworms, whoops, which are... They spend their life... Epi means outside, geic means soil. So they spend their life outside of the soil. If they're outdoors, they get a tan, and sure enough, they are dark brown or red from top to toe. If you are stay indoors all the time, then you'll get pale and pasty, and that's what, exactly what happens to the endogeic earthworm. So endo means inside, and geic means soil. So these spend all the time inside the soil getting extremely pale and pasty. So again, colour coded. Anisic earthworms, this doesn't give you any clues, anisic, unfortunately, it's from a French word, but they've got a dark head and a pale tail. So you want to hazard a guess how they live. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they tail in the ground, head out. And what they do is, these are the deep burrowing earthworms. They have deep, permanent burrows, 
which um, can extend down to two metres into the ground. They can be 10 or 15 within a single patch of, of ground, and they'll reach their heads out and forage for food, dragging it towards them. And then sometimes they'll plug up the top of their burrows, because I don't know if they can find, sometimes with stones. But um, a friend of mine is a uh, farm's geese, and um, whenever the geese molt their feathers, the earthworms gather up all the feathers and plug their, <laughs> their earthworm burrows, and it looks like he's planted goose feathers all over the field. <coughs> There's another final honorary group called the compost earthworms. These are effectively epigenic earthworms because the compost is an accumulation of organic matter on the surface, I suppose. But all of our compost worms are very stripy, so this one here, Dendrobena venita, is an extremely stripy earthworm as well. There are also tiny little relatives of the earthworms, which go to about, I suppose, maximum four centimetres, the smallest ones are you know, about four millimetres, and they're called enchytraids. And there's a little tiny white pot worms, and you often find them in more acidic situations than you would find earthworms, and also in high organic matter situations as well. There are also, of course, vertebrates that live in the soil. Now, to be honest, vertebrates include all sorts of creatures, moles, rabbits, voles, badgers, also kingfishers, puffins, manx shearwaters, they're all soil organisms, they spend a lot of time in the soil. However, there are other people who deal with these organisms, so I don't tend to focus very much on them. They do have an impact on the soil, of course, especially moles, they'll affect drainage. But in fact, the vertebrate that's got the greatest impact on soil is, of course, us. And more about that later. All of this life is linked together. These are not organisms that don't interact, they're constantly interacting with each other and constantly eating each other, in many cases, in what's called the soil food web. But the most important part of the soil food web is up here at the top, because this is where all of the energy comes from, from the sun through the plants. Once it's in the litter, once it's in the plant, it can go as litter, it can go as root exudates, it can go out to the mycorrhizal fungi, it can go from decaying roots and so on, and then it can feed this hugely complicated array of different organisms. Now this looks like a complicated diagram, and I'm sorry to say it's nowhere near as complicated as the reality. Um, <laughs> because of course there are many, many different species, all occupying different niches. So um, their soil biology, generally speaking, is uh, extremely diverse. And one of the reasons it's so diverse is because there are so many different tiny niches within the soil, such a lot of separation, such a lot of different pathways through which energy can travel, that creates a huge amount of diversity. What's also interesting, though, about the soil food web is what happens at the far end. The top predators down here in the soil, and the earthworms, who are just eating the litter directly, go back to feed the above ground biomass as well. And I think that's really important because that links the energy that goes into the soil. It's not just a dustbin where all of the energy ends up and stays. It feeds the rest of the environment as well. Most of the life in the soil, however, is found just in the top few centimetres. In a natural ecosystem, such as a woodland or a, a grassland, in the top one or two centimetres, you'll find a huge amount of organisms, and as you go down, you get fewer and fewer. I've got a graph here showing ne nematodes. This is depth in centimetres down here. And you can see that in the top 15 centimetres in this woodland, that's this line here, there's a huge amount of nematodes in the top, and they drop down to less than half within 15 centimetres. And you never entirely lose the ne nematodes. In fact, some end up in cave systems many kilometres down. I think the deepest organism in the world is a springtail. It was found, I think, seven kilometres into the, the Earth's crust. <laughs> but um, as you can see, there's, most of the organisms are living just at the top there. And the reason for that is that's where the food is. That's where the plants are putting the food in, and that's where the energy is available. In terms of the biomass and numbers, in a handful of soil, you might get um, 100 billion bacterial cells and 50 kilometres of fungi of maybe 1,000 different species. Um, you might also find maybe 100,000 protozoa or 10,000 nematodes of 100 different species. And the bigger the organisms get, the fewer organisms you get, and the fewer species you get. So as you go down, these are our calembola, these are our um, springtails, these are our mites and so on. You maybe get 500 species and 100 individuals. When you get to mammals, of course, if you've only got a handful of soil, you might only get 1,000th of a badger in your hand. <coughs> but also, of course, plant roots. There can even be half a kilometre of plant roots in your handful of soil. Again, hugely important. What about biomass? How much have we actually got? Well, in an arable field, you might get, let's just see if I can, oh, there we are, five tonnes of soil organisms in one hectare, which is the equivalent of about 100 sheep. So what I've done is I've um, converted my soil organisms, biomass, into, into sheep. And I've also drawn a hectare so you can see what that would look like. So there's quite a lot of soil organisms. If you had that many sheep in a field, they would have quite an effect, wouldn't they? But arable fields are among the least populous and least uh, have their lowest biomass of soil organisms. If we went to a grassland field, such as this, here's my hectare of grass, well, we actually have 50 tonnes of soil organisms per hectare, which is 2,000 sheep. <laughs> 
So if you can imagine that much going on in a typical grassland, that's going to have an enormous impact on the, um, on the functions of the soil. First of all, I'm going to start with soil structure. Most soils wouldn't actually have structure without soil life. It's not just a mixture. Soil has to be built, it has to be structured together. And a way to remember this is um, it's rather like a morning in a playgroup. So in a morning in a playgroup, you might have moving, you might have painting, eating, gluing and sewing. <laughs> and um, uh, this is how soil structure happens. The way it actually happens is not with children. <laughs> First of all, we're going to talk about the moving side of things. Now this is, if you could see it, a little pile of soil that has been built outside of my house by some extremely busy ants. Soil organisms that are bigger, bigger than an ant, ants and earthworms, are constantly moving soil around and regenerating that. So that's one way in which new soil pores are being created, new tunnels are being created, soil is being moved. Furthermore, earthworms are also eating the soil as well, and by eating the soil they roll up together the mineral particles, the bacteria in their stomachs, they actually put lime into, the, um, into their guts as well, secrete lime onto the, um, onto the soil that they eat and mix it up with organic matter. And what comes out of the other end is worm casts are actually incredibly stable soil structure. They're new soil aggregates, new soil crumbs. Around the outside of these soil aggregates, you will get a flush of bacterial growth, and that forms a biofilm on the outside. So it's rather like you've painted your soil um, crumb with varnish, because these can actually become quite um, hydrophobic. You know, once, they, once they've dry on the outside, a bacterial film can really stop um, the, that soil from, from getting too wet and collapsing. And furthermore, the fungal hyphae and the plant roots then come in and sew the soil together. So it's rather like you've taken your soil aggregate and sprayed it with silly string to hold it together. And finally, inside the soil, there's also quite a lot of organic matter, which forms a very good soil glue. And this one here, I don't know if you can see, it's a glowing fluorescent green. And the reason it's glowing fluorescent green is because we've used the same dye that we used on the mycorrhizal fungi. It's picking up a particular set of proteins that's produced by mycorrhizal fungi called glomalin-related soil protein. It's a family of proteins that are made mostly by mycorrhizal fungi. And that stuff, although you can see it was all over the mycorrhizal fungi, it was picked up in that, um, in that picture that we saw with the green roots going across, it's also making this soil particle glow green. And that's because 25% of the soil organic matter in a soil aggregate can be this glomalin-related stuff. And it's incredibly good at holding those soil particles together. It's excellent soil glue. If you do an aggregate stability test, on a range of soils from loads of different managements, the amount of glomalin within that soil particle pretty much explains how well the soil particle holds together if you shake it up in water, which is that measure of aggregate stability. Interestingly, of course, because um, uh, grasslands are full of soil fungi, grasslands perform best in terms of aggregate stability. So the, you get the most stable aggregates there, the least stable aggregates end up with the, the arable intensive land at the bottom there. We also wanted our soils to release nutrients as well, and we wanted them in the right place and at the right time. How do soil organisms achieve that? Well, remember the plant root that was leaking its soup out and the bacteria that were coming to eat it? Those bacteria um, need to have, they balance their carbon to nitrogen ratio. Everybody in this barn is, has a carbon to nitrogen ratio that they need to keep in balance. But when we eat food, we respire some of the carbon that we take in and breathe it out as carbon dioxide. That leaves us with too much nitrogen, so we have to get rid of the nitrogen, and we have toilets at the back for that purpose. <laughs> so, what the bacteria are doing is they uh, come along, they eat the food that the plant has produced, they breathe out some of the carbon dioxide, and they release a little bit of the nitrogen back to the plant. Well, all the plant's doing is it's getting back its own nitrogen there, so it's not really gained anything. But other organisms come. This bacterial feeding nematode swims along through the soil, attracted by the bacteria. So it's come from elsewhere in the soil, bringing its nitrogen in its own body to the soil and starts to feed on the bacteria. That helps to release the carbon and the nitrogen from within the bacterial biomass back to the plant. So the plant's getting even more of its own nitrogen back again. But then this bacteria is eaten by a predatory nematode that swum along. It's becoming a feeding frenzy. This predatory nematode eats the bacteria, respires some of the carbon dioxide, and it starts releasing nitrogen from the nematode. Now that's new nitrogen. That's nitrogen that has wandered to the plant root because the plant has created this feeding frenzy. And in fact, this carries on all the way down the, um, the, through the soil food web. So predatory mites are eating the, um, the predatory nematodes, and those will then release the nitrogen. So actually, the nitrogen in the soil is walking and swimming and wriggling to the plant root, and then releasing itself in this monstrous feeding frenzy. So this is an example of how plants control the show, to be honest, isn't it? They are, they're extremely canny creatures. So they have um, got nutrients being released in the right place at the right time. 
But of course, I've already explained that we have another mechanism for that as well. Because in mycorrhizae, the plants are feeding an organism which they're then sending out to get nutrients whenever they want. And in fact, the plant again controls this. If you feed a plant a lot of mineral nutrients, bagged fertilizer, it doesn't bother feeding the, the fungi, it doesn't bother striking up these relationships. It says, no, actually, I don't need you. So again, these mycorrhizal fungi are very good ways in which the plant is controlling that nutrient release for itself. So these are mechanisms, as I say, have been working for 399 million years before we came on. We also wanted the soil biology to decompose organic matter, but also to store organic matter. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, what happens when a new piece of organic matter hits the soil, like this leaf, is initially all the readily decomposable compounds, the simple proteins and the sugars and so on, are rapidly decomposed and you get a flush of CO2. Most of the material, if you imagine a pile of grass clippings, that disappears pretty quickly, doesn't it? It kind of reduces in size and that's the initial loss of the CO2. What's left at the end of that pile of grass clippings is a kind of final compost, isn't it? That's a lot of cellulose and so on, it's a bit tougher to decompose. That decomposes more slowly. And of course, when these things are decomposing, they're actually not just decomposing, they're being eaten. Eaten by bacteria, eaten by fungi, eaten by other organisms. And as it goes through the soil food web, as this organic matter goes through, it becomes tougher and tougher and tougher, and there's less and less material that's easily decomposed. Until eventually, what's left at the end are incredibly tough compounds that have been through many, many different soil organisms. Some of them have been built into different protective compounds and... And they're actually very, very, very difficult to decompose. Now, maybe only 1% or 2% of the carbon that was in that leaf has ended up in this pool of very, very tough material at the bottom. But it decomposes so slowly that what happens is it builds up over time. So if we have our three pools, this is our leaves going in, this is our pile of grass cuttings, this is our compost that's created, and this, is the, this brown stuff is the material that's left at the end, the really tough stuff that almost nothing can decompose. And initially, you end up with a, a lot of the uh, organic matter being dominated by the fresh stuff, but because it builds up and because it decomposes so slowly, the tough stuff eventually builds up and becomes the dominant kind of organic matter in the soil. And it will stay there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So we are managing, amazingly, to get decomposition of waste materials, recycling of nutrients, and carbon storage, all being delivered by soil organisms. This stuff as well, the really old organic matter, you can think of it as the, 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 after the dung of the soil organism has been eaten, and after the dung of that one's been eaten, and after the dung of that one's been eaten. At the end of this stuff, you'll end up with some, a wide range of different organic chemicals. So I've just made this, so this is a chemical formula <laughs> for soil organic matter. But what's interesting about this is, what's correct about this chemical formula is we've got these little hydroxyl groups on the edges. And those hydroxyl groups have got a negative charge. So they're like a magnet. Now, in the soil, these have got positive charges, so that's ammonium, that's potassium, we've also got calcium and magnesium. Many of these are plant nutrients, and the organic matter will cling on to them because these have got positive charges, these have got negative charges, and the organic matter acts like a sort of uh, exchange site, is what we call it. And plants can access this because plants produce acids in their roots, and they will acidify the soil as they grow, that's why farmers have to lime soils because plants are always acidifying it. And when they leak out the hydrogen, it knocks off that potassium and the plant can absorb it. Another nice thing about this material as well is it's extremely hydrophilic. So actually, you can predict how much water is in a soil pretty well by knowing how much organic matter there is, and vice versa. Um, so it holds onto water incredibly well, so we've managed to solve that problem as well. It's also, as I say, very difficult to decompose, so do not eat. <laughs> it, lasts the soil in a long, it lasts in the soil for a long time. So we've got something that holds onto the water. What about getting rid of the water that's excess as well? So we wanted to help it to hold on. Our soil organic matter is doing that. But um, the earthworms, back to our big organisms again, are capable of dealing with the getting rid of water. So if you actually have earthworms in your soil, there was an experiment done in Central America where they zapped all of the earthworms out of the soil by electrocuting them. And on a typical rainstorm, it actually doubled the runoff that came back off that land. So by having these earthworms in your soil, it will actually really improve the infiltration rate. The, remember, the epigeic ones are only on the surface, so they don't help too much. They just kind of provide food <coughs> for the endogeic ones. They just go forwards and backwards through the topsoil, so they don't really provide too much uh, drainage either. But the anisic earthworms, on this graph it goes down to 60 centimetres. That could actually be inches. These can be two metres deep, huge burrows, sometimes the thickness of my finger. They will hugely increase the infiltration rate. So that's getting rid of water and storing water. Pest control and biodiversity. Well, if you've got a lot of soil organisms in your 
soil, I've already mentioned that only 15% of those nematodes are problematic. So if you can outnumber your pests with a large, diverse community of other predatory <coughs> organisms, then that's great. Also remember that feeding frenzy that's happening around the root. That is effectively a, a zone where if you are a, a plant parasitic nematode, if you are foolish enough to wander into that feeding frenzy, you will be devoured by something. So predators can also eat pest species and prevent outbreaks, and they will even listen to the chemical signals that plants give out and respond to cries for help. This has been demonstrated above ground. If a plant is being eaten by a, a herbivorous mite, then predatory mites will smell the chemical that the plant is giving out and come rushing to, the, to, to, the, to its aid. Also, the microbes that um, tend to grow around plant roots prime the plant to grow. They can produce growth hormones. They can increase plant, um, uh, plant, the plant's own uh, sort of antimicrobial defences, and they can fight off other pests as well. And earthworms, incidentally, can actually incubate some of these beneficial bacteria in their guts. And if you have deliberately infect a soil with, say, fusarium, and then introduce earthworms, the earthworms will clean up that soil, reduce the number of fusarium spores, and increase the number of fluorescent pseudomonas bacteria in order to actually help the crops to grow. So they're incubating good bacteria effectively in the soil. So, soil is incredibly helpful to us. Obviously all of these processes are things we wanted to do. And what do we do to the soil? Do we help the soil for the most part? Well, since we came along, agriculture has now been around for about nine and a half um, thousand years. And um, uh, we have really treated the soil, we've kind of ignored and tried to, to push aside soil biology to some extent, much more so with intensive agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, cultivation has always been part of agriculture, but what does that actually do? It really chops up the fungal hyphae that are holding the soil together. It breaks open the soil aggregates, it exposes the organic matter inside to bacterial attack, and once the bacteria have eaten it, they become dormant and they're kind of smash and grab raiders, I suppose, bacteria. And it effectively wastes the soil organic matter that was otherwise hiding in those soil aggregates. And the problem with cultivation is, having done that, you think you've created a good soil structure by digging the soil. But all you're doing is breaking up clods, effectively, because soil structure has to be built by that playgroup method that I mentioned earlier. All that painting and sewing and gluing and eating. <coughs> but instead of letting the organisms paint and sew and glue and eat, we tend to just drag um, plows through the soil. And if you do that, then what happens is you end up destroying the soil structure, which means, means that the soil collapses more readily, you get more soil compaction, people reach for the plough again, you get more tillage, and you end up with this kind of um, downward spiral, I suppose, of, of, of soil structure. Also, soil cultivation has become far more polarised in the country. This was the percentage, darker colours are higher percentage, of soils being cultivated in 1875. And you can see that everything's kind of mid-grey. You get to 1995, the east of the country is almost entirely cultivated, and the west of the country is almost entirely uncultivated. So we've seen a polarisation of, of different farming practices. Now that's a bit of a problem because if you cultivate the soil, you will also get far more compaction. And I'll just um, demonstrate how compaction works. So when people think of compaction, they tend to think of a physical crushing of the soil. And that's one way to do it, certainly. But in fact, soils can compact even without driving a tractor over them. And this is how. If you have a soil aggregate that's well glued and varnished and held together by the soil organisms, then actually it's, water doesn't penetrate between them. So it's well, it's got the silly string all over it, it's got this varnish on it, it's got lots of organic glues to hold it together. This one here, we haven't got so much biological activity, we haven't got so much bacteria, we haven't got so many fungal hyphae growing on the outside. The water penetrates between the mineral particles. And what happens if you build a sandcastle that's just made of mineral particles and you pour water on it, it'll go and that's exactly what happens to soil, they collapse. And when aggregates collapse, they fill in the spaces. The little particles fill in the little spaces, the big particles fill in the big spaces, and you actually end up effectively with soil compaction. And this is what can happen right at the surface, just with raindrops hitting the soil. If the soil structure is weak, then you end up with a little thin layer of collapsed aggregates at the surface, called capping. And that's effectively what soil compaction is. But the same thing happens if you drive a tractor over it. This will be more resistant to having a tractor driven over it because it hasn't got water lubricating all of those soil particles, or those um, mineral particles. This one, when the tractor goes over it, will just collapse. Now, what happens then if you do get a compacted soil? Well, a compaction generally means fewer pores, smaller pores, less movement of water and air, the pores are less well connected as well. And the impacts on soil biota are really quite tricky to measure, and it often depends on the situation. But generally speaking, if you have a soil that's become denser than 1.7 grams per centimetre cubed, which is about only less than a third pore space, so you've lost a third, um, you know, about, well, you only have a, a third of the soil volume as pores. 
then you can only really ever get negative effects on the microbe biomass and decomposition processes. We've also found that if you compact forest soils, then you actually start to lose large numbers of the soil mesofauna, but also the rare species as well tend to disappear. You just tend to get the, the common, widely distributed ones. And of course, if you have a compacted soil, then you start to get more less infiltration, more water-filled pores, which then leads to more nitrous oxide emissions and more runoff and pollution going into the rivers as well. So it's pretty bad news altogether if you have a compacted soil. What can you do about it? Well, lots of people reach for a subsoiler or a topsoil loosener. It can be used with grasslands. Um, one issue with this, because what it will do is it will create a big physical hole through the soil. It will lift and attempt to create more, more space in the soil. It only tends to last for a few years. And on the one experiment which has actually looked at this, and it was only on one site, they found that if you go from an unloosened soil to a shallow loosened soil or a deep loosened soil, you actually lose your earthworms. And you don't just lose all the earthworms, you specifically lose the deep burrowing ones that were good for drainage. So uh, it's a bit of a question there. Do you want to spend a diesel loosening your topsoil, or do you want to let these organisms loosen your topsoil for you? The thing is, they have to be paid as well. They don't eat diesel, but they do eat organic matter. So earthworms both avoid and remediate compacted soils. But feeding earthworms more organic matter should encourage more activity. And I've got um, these are coffee jar wormeries, and they're actually up in the, um, uh, the office here today. And I created one just by putting in different layers. And you can see, even with this light, <laughs> you can still see how much that topsoil has been mixed together by the earthworms. And that was only after, um, I think, two weeks of earthworm activity. So the earthworms will remediate your compaction, but they need to be fed. So you may have to be patient. And however, in the meantime, you can not make it any worse by avoiding plowing and avoiding trafficking. Because actually plowing, although you think you're fluffing up the soil, in fact, you're just making matters worse. Mm -hmm. We put pesticides on the soil, I don't really have time to go into any great detail about this, but amidocoprid, for instance, neonicotinoids, generally bad news for almost everything in the soil. <laughs> also, this is particularly galling, remember I said that the um, actinobacteria produce these anti-helminthic drugs, um, so be the avermectins, I suppose. They were actually produced by the bacteria because they didn't want to be eaten by nematodes and mites. And we use those drugs in order to treat our livestock for nematode and mite problems, of course, so that's why it works. But in fact, what we're now doing is putting it on in such doses that it's ending up in the dung pats in the soil. The dung pats then are being uh, colonised by dung beetles who don't realise that these things are poisonous. And they lay their eggs in them and bury the dung, and then their young just die because they can't survive. They can't detect that these dung pats have been laced with this ivermectin stuff. So um, beetles can't tell the difference, but the problem is, is that we're actually probably destroying our, our populations. And that includes things like hornet robber flies as well, which also lay their eggs in dung and are really quite rare. Furthermore, as well, if the dung starts to lie on the surface because we haven't got enough dung beetles, we'll end up with more and more zones of repugnance, which means the cattle won't graze anywhere near those dung pats until they've been incorporated. So we're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot with, these, um, with some of these um, anti-helminthic drugs. But I think the biggest issue of all for what we, how we maltreat our soils is low organic matter inputs. All of the functions I've talked about carried out by soil biology need food. They need fuel. And if we starve them, then they're not going to work, they will go on strike. And so by gathering up all of the calories that a piece of land grows and taking them away and feeding them to humans or carting them off in lorries, then actually we are starving the ecosystem and all of the soil functions will reduce. Now, it's quite difficult to prove that this actually happens, but um, this is a, map, a graph showing agricultural efficiency, I suppose, wheat yields in France, Germany and the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is the, um, the green line here. And you can see we were bumbling along in the 60s and 70s, quite sort of, and then huge rise in the 80s and 90s, and then since 2000, we've been sort of bumbling along as well at the top. So this is a measure, to some extent, of how good we are at scraping calories off the land and feeding them to humans. Okay? We've become that much better at taking calories away from the environment. This is a graph over the same time period, I've just crunched it up a bit, showing farmland birds. So farmland bird species are these Farmland bird specialists in particular are these blue lines here. They were bumbling along until then, and then they dropped down, and then they roamed, they're flatlining here. It almost exactly mirrors the increase in agricultural productivity. Now, there could be many reasons for that. It could be to do with pesticides, it could be to do with lots of other things, but effectively, there's less food available in these systems for farmland birds to eat. Remember, the stuff going into the soil also goes through to feed the, um, the above ground biomass as well, and all the birds that live on the farm. So what's actually happening to the soil over that period? 
Well, we have got some data. This is from the countryside surveys. They've got three dots on the graph, which show that in arable soils, there had been a significant downward trend during this period in soil organic matter. Now, that's not a huge change, but chances are the soil in arable areas was already quite low anyway. So what we've ended up with is a decline in what was already low. And when you get soil organic matter declining, that shows that there's less going in. So there's less food available in the ecosystem for everything, for all the soil processes and for all the wildlife. Another example, manure input here. You can see the polarisation of the country. There's almost no manure input going into the east of the country and lots of livestock, grass and manure on this side. If you look at soil bulk density, this is data from the um, uh, CEH, the countryside survey, spun up again. You can see the darker colours here are the denser soils, the paler colours are the lighter soils, so the peat being the lightest, least dense soils. So that pretty much follows the pattern of manure input in arable land. And if you look at breeding songbirds, passerines, then you get this pattern. So you see a, there's a general pattern of westerly land holding fewer songbirds. But look at what's happening in our agricultural heartland, associated with the dense soils and the low organic matter inputs. We've got positively Hebridean levels of songbirds breeding there. So I think ecosystem starvation is at the root of many of our conservation problems as well as our soil problems. How do we look after soil life? So I've just given you doom and gloom. Well, actually, luckily, it's dead simple. All we need to do is put more organic matter in or lose less organic matter that's already there. So putting in manures or composts as good as an input of organic matter, but we also can just grow more plants that will end up in the soil because that's where all the energy comes from. And if we end up with more plants such as cover crops that are destined for the soil or even just the roots of grasses or even the dung that goes through from grazing animals gets into the soil, that will help. If we disturb the soil less, so less cultivation and less trafficking will help as well, for the reasons I've explained. And instead of using preventative measures with our um, pesticides, we could actually target those pesticides so that we're only damaging the organisms that we want to damage. It's also worth exploring more diverse cropping as well, because you get a different range of soups going into the, into the soil, and that does change the, the soil communities as well. But I think in order of importance, more fuel going in will always help the most. Luckily, grasslands such as the one here at Langerford and, um, are very good at putting carbon into soil. This is data from uh, a survey of 300 farms or so that was carried out, and we asked how, the farmers how long the land had been in grass, in other words, how long had that sward been established. And we got this trend in soil organic carbon in the topsoil, and it's a bit of a fuzzy gap, and that's possibly because many farmers can't quite remember how many years they have. It got very hazy as it went further on because you literally can't remember what happened sort of 12 years ago. But at least for the times that farmers can remember, we've got a rough trend here of about 1.6 tonnes of carbon per year going into the soil for, for, for being under grass. And eventually that will, of course, flatten out, as I showed you with the, grass, with the graph earlier on carbon storage. What does it do, this cultivation to the, the organisms? Well, I extracted for a workshop some creatures from a continuous arable field, and this is what came out overnight. It's a handful of dust mites and a potworm. By contrast, I also sampled a permanent grassland, and that's what came out. So straight off, you could tell by looking at some of the soil communities, the mesoponic communities, that we've got much more diversity where there's more food going in and less disturbance. So this is immediately telling us that we can learn from what the soil organisms can tell us about the soils. This is being fed more. But even within grasslands, you can see variation. There's a general rule that within these springtails and mite communities, if you have lots of big organisms, like these big fat juicy green springtails, these big fat purple springtails and these big predatory mites, then there's probably rapid nutrient cycling. You need to have accessible nitrogen in order to grow the proteins, in order to grow big and rapidly like this. And they must be growing rapidly because they're poorly defended, because they're being eaten by these mites. On the other side, you've got lots and lots of little brown dots. Those are orobatid mites. These little brown dots can be five years old, as I've mentioned, and they are in it for the long run, so they must have slow nutrient cycling. So this grassland was in agriculturally intensive, getting bagged nitrogen. This grassland had been not ploughed for I think, 40 or 50 years and was reverting to semi-natural grassland. So immediately, very strong contrast between the two communities that you will get within the grasslands. And it works here in Devon as well. I, um, it was mentioned that I did a, a talk at Woodrow and I actually went out and collected a couple of samples here on this um, Trusham, I think it's now Royden, isn't it, this, this unit of soil. Very, same soil type, meadows right next to each other, and they had a very, very slight difference in their history. 
One was um, a hay meadow that had been ploughed a few decades ago, and the other one was grazed, but probably had never been ploughed because it was on steeper ground. But I tried to sample an area that was still on the, you know, the flat bit of the field. And I looked at big organisms by digging a hole, and I looked at small organisms by extracting them under a table lamp like that. And this is what I found. Where we had the hay meadow that had been ploughed maybe 10, 15 years ago, almost all of the big organisms I found were herbivores. So we found these great big swift moth caterpillars were munching away on the grass roots. We also found lots of these clip beetle larvae as well. And really, only one sample well, had any appreciable numbers of earthworms in. So, mostly herbivores. What did I find in the other sample? It was mostly decomposers. This is the grazed land. So instead of taking away the hay, we're leaving more of the um, nutrition in the grazed land. And instead, we got decomposers. We got larger numbers of earthworms of various different kinds, Lumbricus rubellus, that's um, the rosy tip worm, and so on. We had pill millipedes. And these were just the big organisms, of course. And also, with these, um, this was a predator as well. So that's the uh, geophilid centipede. But I also looked at the smaller organisms too. And this is what I found. So this is a comparison between the two communities. Straight off, we can see that here we've got bigger springtails. So we're looking at more nutrient cycling, thanks to these big white springtails and these big green springtails. More rapid nutrient cycling where it had been ploughed 15 years ago. We also had more predators. So these are these big predatory mites. So that ties in with the nutrient cycling story as well. Pretty much absent from this meadow, just over the hedge. We also had a lot of oribatid mites as well, so not only was there rapid nutrient cycling, but there was also some slower nutrient cycling going on in the system in parallel to that. So again, lots of, lots of these um, little black dots, which are the oribatid mites. But interestingly, there was one oribatid mite that was only found in the completely undisturbed meadow that had never been ploughed, Lyocaris xylariae. So, I took it out and I photographed it. That's, that's the creature. Rather beautiful, I think. Very well armoured. It's got these little flanges on the front, lots of little bristles and so on. That's what it looks like from underneath. <laughs> and um, I was very interested because I'd not seen this before and I thought, well, I wonder how rare it is. Now, if you look up on the National Biodiversity Network Atlas, the NBN Atlas, you can get a dot map which shows you where things are found. Unfortunately, this is the dot map for all oribatid mites. So remember these creatures, these tiny black dots that turn up in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in every soil sample that you look at in the grassland? This is the national data set for all of them. Okay. Not really good enough. Luckily, I am the mite person. I do the mite recording <laughs> scheme. And I have been pestering CEOs to give me data, and I've been amassing data, which I will eventually get onto the NDN. And for all of the ones that were found in that cloud meadow, they were all pretty common. They were found scattered across the country, pretty much everywhere. In the other one, there were no records at all for this species. It's the first one that I'm, I'm aware of ever finding in the country. It was still on our list, so somebody must have found it, but I've got no, no idea where they found it or who found it. So this was the first record at Woodard Farm for this particular species. Now, that I think is very interesting because this was an unplowed meadow that had never been plowed up and it's never been found. All of these ones from plowed meadows have been found. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that actually grasslands that are unplowed are valuable and they are threatened. This is an example of that. This is um, a map of Dorset. This is the Dudley stamp mapping from the 1930s. And we've used the same, or oh, the, um, uh, the authors of this paper have used the same uh, colour scheme for both maps here. Pale yellow is calcareous unimproved grassland. Pale green is neutral unimproved grassland. And we've also got heath in purple, for instance. Those are probably the ones to point out. And brown in arable. So we've got a mixture of arable and unimproved grassland across the, the downland of Dorset. By 2000, this is what had happened. Pretty much all of the unimproved grassland has become intensive grassland. Pretty much a lot of it has become arable as well. All the neutral grassland, look how much that's extended into... has now changed into arable land. Red, incidentally, is coniferous forestry. We now have coniferous forestry instead of heathlands or urban instead of heathlands as well. So huge land use changes. 96% of our lowland meadows, lowland unimproved grasslands, have been lost to agricultural intensification. And this means that animals like Lyocaris xylaria, that have only been found once on one unimproved grassland, will have been in huge decline. The problem is, we don't actually know what's happened because we don't have records. People were not recording these organisms back then. And it, as a conservationist, my work 
is um, uh, primarily dealing with trying to train people to record more <coughs> of these organisms because all conservation needs to understand trends in the organisms in order to understand threats 